We're going to look at Matthew chapter 13, and tonight we're actually going to be covering something very interesting. I would recommend onlineers to please watch the Kingdom of Heaven versus the Kingdom of God first before watching this video. That way they can understand the difference. The Kingdom of Heaven, if you might recall, is a physical earthly kingdom that is uh, set up for the nation of Israel. The Kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom that is set for the Christian church. These are two very different kingdoms. But I'm going to be talking to you now about a third and fourth kingdom. There's a third and a fourth kingdom. Well, if I'm going to be doctrinally honest, doctrinally to be honest, there are only two kingdoms, kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God. However, there are two additional kingdoms which is going to be very, very helpful for you to understand the kingdom of heaven versus the kingdom of God. And then it will also help you understand the postponement theory as well. For some of you who did not watch the postponement theory, it would be good that you watch the video Rapture Postponed. If you can watch that video, then it would be very, very helpful to you. But these two kingdoms are going to be intensely interesting and eye-opening as you study the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. So we're going to be covering, I think interchangeable, you dropped the E, right? Or I don't know. I'll just, I'll just, I think you dropped the E. I yeah. think, yes, you dropped the E. Okay, because I know in judgment they put the E before the M. So, All right then. So anyways, the two kingdoms that you want to know. Kingdom of heaven in mystery form. These are the two additional kingdoms that can be helpful to you to understand more about the kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God. And then the second one is the interchangeable kingdom. The interchangeable kingdom. And then I'm going to put of God. If you understand these two things, these will be incredibly helpful to you. And we're going to combine them with the parables of Jesus at Matthew 13. So we're going to understand all the interpretation to these parables. And then you're going to, and it's all combined with the kingdom of heaven in mystery form. And we're going to discuss the interchangeable kingdom. All right, let's begin. We're going to have some fun tonight. Man, this thing always tangles up to that bar. Okay, Matthew chapter 13. Let's begin. Verse 1. <coughs> the same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside. Verse 3. And he spake many things unto them in parables. And this entire chapter consists of seven parables. But when he discusses these parables, look what the disciples say at verse 10. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know, look at the wording here, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. So when Jesus speaks these seven parables in Matthew 13, he calls them mystery, this kingdom of heaven. So notice that this kingdom of heaven is now spoken in mystery. It's not like the other parts when you study about the kingdom of heaven when Jesus talked about it. He never said mystery concerning about the kingdom of heaven in those other statements and verses. He mentioned that uh, everything is going to be visible to the eye. Jews were expecting a physical earthly kingdom that is public, that everyone will know. That's what the Jews were expecting, right? But the kingdom of heaven, it's a physical earthly kingdom that is public, that is known to the Jews. But look at this kingdom of heaven in mystery. It's not publicly given to Jews. It's hidden from them. Keep reading. Verse uh, 12. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away even that he hath. 
Therefore speak I to them in parables, because, mark this down, this verse, you're going to need to remember this verse, because they sing, see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand, and then is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart, that's the Jews, he is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. So notice right here that to the Jews, Jesus Christ, when he spoke the kingdom of heaven here, it's not public. It's not like what he said, go only to the house of Israel, when preaching about the kingdom of heaven. Right here, he says that this kingdom of heaven, the earthly physical kingdom, is in mystery to the Jews. It's mystery to them. All right, let's look at Acts 28. Acts 28. What does that mean? Acts chapter 28. What that means, did you recall? Do you know what a mystery is? Do you recall what Jesus said? If you recall what Jesus said at Matthew uh, chapter 13, when he spoke about the mystery of the kingdom of heaven, he mentioned that it's a mystery and that it's blinded from them. And uh, I don't know if you recall what the word mystery is, but uh, let's, let's go one by one here. This is a key if you look up the word mystery. If you look up the word mystery, what it means is hidden. The kingdom of heaven in mystery form, the kingdom of heaven is hidden. When did a physical earthly king kingdom, when was it hidden from the nation of Israel. It was as if it was no more and gone. Do you remember when the kingdom of heaven is supposed to be gone and replaced with the kingdom of God? That's during the church age, right? What happened? The Jews rejected their earthly physical king. So because of that, that physical earthly king was vacant from his earthly kingdom. And the kingdom of heaven became hidden as the Jews was being transitioned to Gentile. When it was switched to Gentile, that kingdom of heaven became hidden throughout that whole time. Because the mystery was not given to them. So it depends on this transition of Jew to Gentile. That's the key about this. The transition goes from Jew to Gentile. Because remember, Jesus said that it's supposed to fulfill the scripture of Isaiah, that they have ears and eyes, but their ears are going to be dull of hearing, their eyes are going to be blinded, the Jews. But when Jesus said that, Paul continued that verse and said, what that meant was, it's going to be hidden from the Jews and given to the Gentiles. Look at Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28, verse 25. And Paul is speaking to Jews here, verse 25. And when they agreed not among themselves, and they departed after that Paul had spoken one word, well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross and their ears are dull of hearing. See, that's repeating what Jesus said when he spoke about the kingdom of heaven in mystery. Keep reading. And hear with their ears and, under and understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. Be it known therefore. See that? So therefore, meaning because of that verse where the Jews are blinded, what's going to consequently happen? 
unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. See, it's switched to Gentile. So when this kingdom of heaven is in mystery form, what that meant was that it's being hidden from the Jews and somehow it has to do with Gentiles getting involved. Why? Why are Gentiles involved? Remember what Jesus said at Matthew 13? Unto you it is given the mysteries. Who are given the mysteries? 1 Corinthians 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. First Corinthians chapter 4. Who's given the mysteries? Yeah, the church. The church, that's us. That's why, I mean, think about it. You don't think so? Think about it. Do you think the Jews know the difference between the kingdom of heaven versus the kingdom of God? No. Do they understand the mysteries of the parables that relate to the kingdom of heaven in mystery form? Who's the one that's learning it? You right now. Us right now. That's why the scripture's fulfillment is concerning us. We got 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the what? Mysteries of God. You and I are stewards of the mysteries of God. So then the church is heavily involved, the church age here. And by the way, did you forget, during the church age, there's no doubt we're in charge of the mysteries. <laughs> Let me give you two of them. Uh, let's look at Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Isn't the church age supposed to be a mystery? Isn't it? That the Gentiles become part of the body of Christ? That the Gentiles partake in this when this switch goes to Gentile? That this is considered to be a mystery? See, it's all matching up with what Jesus said in Matthew 13. All right, Ephesians chapter 3. Notice that the Bible says at verse 3, how that by revelation he made unto, known unto me the mystery, which is what? Verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. What's considered to be the mystery? The, uh, that the Gentiles suddenly come in. That's the mystery. So when Jesus talks about the stuff in mystery, you got to keep your uh, eyes and ears open that this is going to involve us somehow. This is going to involve this church age somehow. Whenever the Bible talks about a mystery, you have to think about, I wonder if the church is somehow involved in this. Why? Because, uh, but the kingdom of heaven is a physical earthly kingdom for Jews. Yeah, but the Bible says it's hidden to the Jews. It's in mystery form. So this is not the same as kingdom of heaven. This is kingdom of heaven in mystery form, you have to understand. So when the Bible talks about kingdom of heaven in mystery form, you have to think about that there's going to be a, the church involved in this. This does not mean the Jew is not involved in this. The Jew is certainly involved in this. Why? Because you need something that's hidden. It's hidden from the Jews. See? So Jews have to be involved in this too. Why? Because you need the Jewish people to be hidden from. Romans 11. Did you pay attention to Romans 11? We read this so many times, but I don't know if you knew this. And Paul told the Christians to not be ignorant of the mystery. That what? We switched from Jew. That God uh, cast off the nation of Israel. He hid from them temporarily. Romans chapter 11. Look at this. If you don't believe that the eyes are hidden, that the eyes are blinded, keep, look at Romans 11.25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. Because you're supposed to be stewards of the mysteries. All right, that's you. Lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. That, look at this, blindness, I told you. Blindness in part is happened to Israel. See that? Until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. How about that? That's the kingdom of heaven in mystery form. Why? It's hidden from the Jews. Now, we're also going to look at the book of Luke 17. Luke 17.
We're going to look at uh, Luke, and then, uh, let's see here, I, I'm hoping that 17, I'm probably wrong right here. No, it's not 17. Let me look at 19 quickly. Yeah, it's 19. 19, sorry, Luke 19, Luke chapter 19. Now, if you recall my teaching upon, on the postponement theory, all right, you might recall what I mentioned here. Verse 12, what did the king do? The Bible says in verse 12, he said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself the kingdom, right? Jesus came to start his physical earthly kingdom, kingdom of heaven, but what happened? And to return. He has to come back for it again. Why? It was postponed. It was postponed. So this physical earthly kingdom he set up for the Jews has been postponed. But look what the verse says at verse 11. Verse 11. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of what? God should immediately appear. Notice it didn't say a kingdom of heaven here. It says kingdom of God. Wait a minute. Then your, wasn't your teaching wrong? And some people had this question like in the postponement theory, but isn't this talking about the kingdom of God, a spiritual kingdom for Christians? Not for Jews? Here's something interesting. So what you, they didn't learn is this doctrine. The interchangeable kingdom of God is next. All right, this is so important for you to learn. All right, why is it interchangeable with the kingdom of God? Because a lot of times when the Bible talks about uh, the kingdom of God, it would be in a reference to the kingdom of heaven sometimes. Didn't you know that? You might go, really? Yeah, they're, two, they're, they're related. But they're not the same. They're still different. But they would be related and mentioned as the same sometimes. But what in the world? You know, uh, what does this mean? Oh, it's so much fun when you study the scriptures. Look at Mark 16. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. Now Mark chapter 16. <clears throat> Mark chapter 16. Now look what Jesus said, and we're going to compare that with Matthew 4. <clears throat> we're going to look, compare that with Matthew chapter 4. Now, notice right here about the signs and the wonders that accompany all right? It follows the gospel of the kingdom. For some of you who don't know, the gospel of the kingdom is in reference to the Jews. All right? It has no reference to the church. The gospel of the kingdom is a reference to Jews where signs and wonders are being performed by the apostles. Why? Why were they performed by the apostles? It's so that the Jews can believe in their Messiah, and once they believe in their Messiah, they can get their earthly kingdom. If you don't believe me, look at Matthew 4. Let's start off from there. Matthew 4. The Bible says at verse 23, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. But look what followed, signs and wonders, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Verse 24, all those signs and wonders healings. That matches with Mark 16. Look at Mark 16. All right, keep your hand here though. Mark 16. Verse 15. Verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Amen. Notice in verse seven, uh, 17, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Look at that. So notice right here, this matches, these signs and wonders matches with Matthew 4, 23 through 24. The gospel of the kingdom. That's not Paul's Christian gospel. Because Paul's gospel did not come out yet. So this is referring to the gospel of the kingdom. However, why do Christians take that as a great commission applying to them to preach the gospel? That's the problem, isn't it? Isn't that confusing? I, 
Isn't this supposed to be a gospel for the Jews rather than for the Christians? Why do Christians take Mark 16 then as part of their gospel? That don't make sense. There's no doubt Christians are involved with uh, Mark 16 because it talks about uh, the belief. Uh, it talks about in Mark chapter 16 where it mentions about the gospel to every creature. So that means to all nations, Jew and Gentile out there. Right. Not only that, Peter repeated that at Acts chapter 10 and 11, that the commission about preaching to all nations and baptizing, he says that Mark 16 was a fulfillment of what he was doing to those Gentiles at Acts 10 and 11. Amen. So then we see that Christian church are involved, but then this is Jew, so this is so confusing. No, it's not confusing because the gospel that they were to be preaching is basically the kingdom right here. The kingdom is involving right here the interchangeable kingdom of God. What does that mean, the interchangeable kingdom of God? You still haven't answered my question, Pastor. The answer to that question is this, all right? But it might be more confusing, but I'll answer the question more. Go to the book of Matthew. All right, <clears throat> we're going to look at uh, chapter uh, 4. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 4 and then Mark 1, Mark 1. Matthew 4 and Mark 1. Now notice what Jesus preached here. Jesus preached what was at hand. He said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was an earthly physical kingdom for Jews. Matthew chapter 4. Verse 17, <clears throat> from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was his first message. But look what Mark said at Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Look at uh, verse 14, 14. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom, look at this, of God. That's the same thing as the gospel of the kingdom at Matthew 4, because keep reading, and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. There is no doubt what Mark was talking about preaching the gospel was Jesus' commission was this kingdom for the Jews. Mark said kingdom of God. Matthew said kingdom of heaven. So then there's like so much confusion. But I thought that uh, the... The kingdom of heaven is an earthly physical kingdom for Jews, whereas the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom for Christians. So here's the answer to this that some of you don't know. Kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven are different. But why were they together right here? Because what's going on is that both are happening at the same time. Amen. Now you might say, why is that? Because God is right there. Yeah. Spiritual kingdom. God is right there. He can commence it with an earthly physical kingdom right there. That's the reason why these things were interchangeable. So then that's why in Luke and Mark 16 and all the other places, when God talks about the uh, gospel of the kingdom or when he's focusing about the earthly physical kingdom for the Jews, He'll sometimes say kingdom of God when in reference to the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because God is a spirit. Kingdom of God is spiritual. You have to have something spiritual with that earthly physical kingdom. I mean, at Revelation, what's going to happen? At Revelation, God who is a spirit, he's going to come down here on earth, set up his future kingdom on Israel on earth, and both the kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God will be there at the same time. Why did Jesus preach that in Matthew and Mark? Because Jesus Christ was right then and right there. They had God right then and right there. And he was about to commence something. That's the reason why. But another thing is this. Another thing is that some people do not understand where, well, I don't think that you can go interchangeable with kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, that they're both different, but that they can be somehow the same. No, it can be. For for example, if I were to say uh, the, uh, the apartment, ad I'm not going to give my address so that onlineers hound me, you know, but the, the address, number, number, road, city, Santa Clara, California. So if I say the house at 
Santa Clara with the given address. That's a physical uh, location and place. And then if I were to say the house of, or the, the house of Gene Kim, is Gene Kim as the same as Santa Clara? No, they're very different. Gene Kim is me. Personally, me, I'm very different from uh, Santa Clara. It's a city. However, is there a difference when I say uh, the house of Santa Clara or the house of Gene Kim? No, they can be the same. Why? Because both people are there. Both people are there. That's the reason why. But let's say Gene Kim is away from Santa Clara. If he's gone from Santa Clara, then the house at Santa Clara is not going to be the same as the house of Gene Kim anymore. Why? Because somebody else can take over that house at Santa Clara. Which is what? Which is the devil's people. So then what we see... So in other words right here, we see God... See, the kingdom of God, personal name, like the house of Gene Kim. Kingdom of heaven, like the house of Santa Clara, physical location, right? We see right here, they are very different, but they, but they can be the same if God is right here. But if he's absent, then what happens to this kingdom? It's still known as the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't change that fact. But if he's gone and uh, this part becomes hidden, then what happens is... This physical locality can belong to somebody else. You didn't know that? Go to Daniel. Go to Daniel and Luke 4. Go to Daniel. Chapter 2. Daniel 2. And then go to Luke 4. Luke 4. And I want you to add Matthew 11 as well, which I'm not going to turn there for time's sake, but Matthew 11 says, The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. So notice this physical locality of a kingdom can be taken away by some violent people, by somebody else. So we can see there is no doubt, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God is undoubtedly different. Unless you can say the kingdom of God is taken violently and that it's uh, being taken over by wicked people and etc. But let's look at Daniel chapter 2. Let's look at Daniel chapter 2 verse 37. Daniel 2 verse 37. Look at this. To Nebuchadnezzar. Thou, O king, art a king of kings for the God of who? Heaven hath what? Given thee a kingdom. That's an earthly kingdom. But it's given to what? Nebuchadnezzar. It's given to Nebuchadnezzar. How about that? You'll also notice at uh, Daniel chapter 2, uh, verse 44. Verse 44. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Now look at this. This kingdom that's given from heaven or a kingdom of heaven, an earthly kingdom it says in the middle of verse 44 and the kingdom shall not be left to other people what does that mean? It was given to other people but God's going to one day take back that kingdom that's given from heaven or kingdom of heaven and get it back for himself see? so there's no doubt this interchangeable relationship exists that's important to understand. There is no doubt this interchangeable relationship exists. So you want to understand this interchangeable kingdom of God. You want to understand that. That is very important. The scriptures can be very enlightening and amazing many times. I mean, don't we say it? I mean, well, this is too confusing. No, you even say it at everyday relationships. Sometimes we'll say that, you know, the, uh, if I say the house... We're going to meet at that uh, apartment at Santa Clara, all right? Then you know what that means. You mean your time about the apartment of Gene Kim, right? But let's say I move to San Jose. Then when you say the apartment at Santa Clara no longer belongs to me, right? Why? Because I'm the one that moved out and it's gone. So see, this is everyday language that we use. And God is just simply using everyday language like he would use with his moving and housing situations. So sometimes when they're interchangeable, why? Because he's right then and there. It's that simple. So he can, even though he knows that they're different, 
He's right then and there. That's why he would use it at the same time, just like I would use it. Concerned about the house at Santa Clara and the house of Gene Kim. Okay, so it's just everyday language, word and use. Now let's go back to Matthew 13. Matthew chapter 13. I mentioned Luke 4, so sorry, but, we, uh, but I'll just make a long story short at Luke 4. What did the devil say? The devil say, all these kingdoms of the world are mine, but it was delivered unto me. Why? Because God gave it to him. God gave it to him. All right, let's look at the book of Matthew chapter 13. Now, to understand how the church is involved in this and how the Jew is involved in this, now let's look at the interpretation of the parables here. Seven parables. Here we go. So then, uh, the first one is the parable of the sower and the seed, right? If Matthew chapter, you can write these down. We're not going to read them for time's sake. Matthew chapter 13, verse 1 through 9. Matthew chapter 13, verse 1 through 9. There's your first parable. The first parable is the sower and the seed. And what's the interpretation? What's the interpretation of the sower and the seed? Well, let's look at the book of Matthew and Jesus Christ will interpret it for us. And what does this relate to this kingdom of heaven in mystery form? Look at verse 18. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. So notice right here that the first part is the sower we want to understand. Now, what we know about the sower is just like we saw at verse 24, what, what you're going to see at verse 24, there's a sower who's sowing seed. You notice that right there? A sower who's sowing seed. Why, you know the one who gives out uh, the seed and the word of God. So the sower that plants out the good seed, and the seed is referring to the word of God. Because why? Verse 19, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom. So the seed is referring to the word. So there's your interpretation. Seed is the word. The ground... Notice right here that it was ground number one is, if you know the story, birds, fowls of the air came to eat the seed, right? By the wayside. Jesus Christ says that that's that ground is referring to Satan just taking away the word from the heart, the wicked one, right? So it's referring to Satan and his minions, taking away the word of God from people's heart so that they don't become receptive. So you notice... Uh, that that's obvious in today, right? You ever seen the Word of God preached? Just go to a Bible-believing church. You'll see these seeds open right before your eyes. The ground open right before your eyes. The interpretation right before your eyes. When you preach the Word of God, what happened? The devil comes and take away the Word of God and they just, uh, they don't care and they walk out. Then you get these people. You get the people at verse 20 and 21. 20 and 21. That's referring to the stony ground, right? What happens? The, the seed, when it's planted on stony ground, it grows up, and you think that you're going to get vegetation and life, but it quickly dies out. What's that referring to? That's referring to people who are responsive to the preaching, and you see that in churches, right? But when they go through hard times and trials, what happens? The Word of God is not able to produce fruit in you. And then some of you uh, bail out on church, right? One Sunday couple Sundays, you don't see you for a long time. See, this, there's no doubt this matches to a T with what we're going through today. Another one is the ground fell upon the ground where thorns came up and choked the vegetation and light. So then the seed wasn't able to produce fruit. What is that referring to? That's referring to the cares of the world. So then you go to churches where people are hearing the word of God, but they don't care. But then they have to see hill song. They have to see something worldly where it chokes the word of God and they don't have fruit for the Lord. That's why these churches today, they hardly have any fruit you see. You notice that? So that's what we see. Then we see the ones on good ground at verse 23. The ones on good ground, they hear the word of God, they understand, and it be bears forth fruit. 
If you look at the book of uh, John, it talks about Jesus being the true vine and that if you abide in the uh, branch, you can bring forth fruit and even much fruit. So this is all referring, we can apply ourselves undoubtedly to this one Amen. in this parable. There's a lot we can see over here that we can apply. All right, now. Another thing to see is the second parable. The second parable is verses 24 through 30. Verses 24 through 30. This is about the tares and wheat. Tares and wheat. What's the parable about the tares and wheat? The tares and wheat is referring, if you read that story, and I'll give the interpretation of it. The Bible talks about good seed being sown at verse 24 again. The seed we know is the Word of God again. Notice it says, in his field, right? Field. All right. What is the field representing? The field is the world. The field is referring to the world. If you look at verse 38, 38, it says the field is the world. You notice that? All right. We know the seed is the Word of God. Who is the sower? Look at verse 37. 37. He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. That's Jesus Christ. So we see that the sower in both parables so far that we looked at is referring to Jesus Christ. Amen. And then the seed is the Word of God. And then the field is representing the world. All right, so obviously we know that there's going to be bad stuff coming out, right? If you're a Bible believer, you know when the Word of God is sown amongst the world, there's going to be some bad stuff coming out, right? And then we also know if the Word of God is sown in the world, there's some good stuff that can come out, right? Well, that's pretty obvious common sense, and notice the parable explains that away. If you uh, look at uh, verse 25, notice that men slept, his enemy came. See that? That's referring to Satan. Satan came, so tears among the wheat and went his way. So he put tears on the wheat. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So notice that tares and wheat were messed up by Satan. Now, why did it say tares and not thorns? Because they look very close to a wheat. They look very close to a wheat. So we know that the wheat or the good fruit that comes out, that's referring to the good believers, right? So the good believers who are able to uh, bring forth the fruit, who have uh, much fruit. So if that's referring to us, then the tares, if they're sown by the devil, they look very close to us Christians, us believers. Isn't that the devil's job? You can't tell if you go to churches today. They all think you're Christians. But we know, and they accuse us of being divisive, and they want to unify. No, we should divide. I don't want to be a tear. I want to tell the difference. For people to say that Catholicism is Christianity, you have no idea what you're talking about, man. That's why Christians believe in doctrine. That's important. Why? You don't want to be a, you don't want to be a tear. See that? But see, people don't care about being tares. So when you see these little pansies coming out saying, you know, in King James Bible debates, you know, I don't know why Christians are so divisive and, you know, we should all unify. You King James only people are overtly divisive. You know what that guy is? He's a tear. He's not, I'm a recovering, you know, from a cult. No, he's a cult himself. He's a tear. These little pansies, you know, attacking Bible-believing Christians who are King James only. I'm the recovering blah, blah, blah. No, yeah, he's a recovering addict. That's what he is. So th these wicked, evil people, they're tares. And they want you to be a tear just like them. That's why they should be called out. And praise the Lord about people calling them out. Christians dividing amongst, arguing with other Christians. No, what did Jesus warn? They're going to look like a Christian. Look like you, believing in right doctrine and everything. You've got to tell the difference apart with these people. Now take it for granted, I know that a lot of people can be saved Christians and be deceived by wrong doctrine, but why is it that these people who are saved Christians just have to act very close like they're right Christian doctrine? That's dangerous. That's scary. Now... <clears throat> Notice that men slept. It didn't say the man or the sower at verse 25. You notice that? 
So that's not Jesus' fault. He wasn't sleeping on the job. It's, it's, there's something wrong with us. We were sleeping on the job. And, be, and trust me, when cr pastors are ignorant of doctrine and sleep on the job about doctrine and don't mention doctrine, guess what? You get tares and wheat together. How about that? You, doctrine's not a big deal. Remember that, guys. Just remember that. And you know what Jesus warned? Jesus warned. Uh, verse, uh, we see right here, Jesus said at verse 29, no, let them both grow together. Leave them alone. Through, throughout the church age, Jesus is letting the church fall into apostasy and let them grow. And then the real, genuine, saved believers will be distinguished from the false Christian believers or the false believers. Jesus says at verse 30, let it grow until the harvest. What is the harvest? The harvest is verse 39. Verse 39, the end. It's referring to the end times. So as the church hits even closer and closer until we reach the end, we're going to have a whole bunch of contamination in the church. This is normal. All right? This is normal. There's going to be contamination in the church. Nothing to freak out about. This is normal. Okay? So until the end of the world, what's going to happen? They're going to be growing together. And what did Jesus say? At verse 30, gather the tares together, the false believers, and bind them in bundles. Why? So I can prepare them to burn them in hell. Notice he didn't say that when the tares are gathered, we cast them to hell first. No, he just says, bind them so that we can get ready to burn them. So he didn't burn them yet. He was gathering and binding them, getting re them ready to burn. And then after that, notice the wheat is what? Raptured. Verse 30, but gather the wheat into my barn. There's your, that's proof then, the pre-tribulation rapture. Amen. See that? We believers have to get out first before the unbelievers, they get gathered together and God prepares them for damnation. Look at the United Nations and the ecumenical movement. That is fulfilling scripture of tares. And you want to be far away from that movement. I, Christians should unite. No, I, sh I should divide. I want to get away from that. Look at the book of uh, Zephaniah. It's fulfilling scripture. Look at what Zephaniah says. It matches with Matthew 13. Matches with Matthew 13. Go to the book of Zephaniah. Chapter 3, chapter 3. Zephaniah. And then uh, we're going to look at chapter 3, verse 8. Chapter 3, verse 8. Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather, right? Like Jesus said, gather the tares, right? Gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms. See, he's binding them, gathering them. Why? To ready his hellfire, to pour upon them my indignation, even all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Notice, shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. See, he's binding and gathering them not to burn them immediately, but to prepare them so that he can burn them in the future. How about that? All right, go back to Matthew 13. Matthew 13. So, Matt, so the tares and the wheat is a great passage concerning about your pre-tribulation rapture. Now, verse 31 through 32. 31 through 32 is your parable about the mustard seed. All right? Parable of the mustard seed. What is the mustard seed? If you go to Matthew 16, go to Matthew 16. We're going to go to the book of Matthew, and I, I, excuse me, chapter 17. It should be 17. Sorry about that. So we're going to look at Matthew, chapter 17. The mustard seed is, to, is representing your faith. It's representing faith, you have to understand. All right, verse 20, verse 20. Notice the Bible says, And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if ye have faith, as a grain of mustard seed. See that? All right, go back to Matthew 13, verse 31 through 32 again. So the mustard seed is representing faith. All right? Now look at this faith. 
The Bible says concerning about the faith that uh, it was sown in the field, right? At verse 31, so that's Jesus Christ sowing, uh, sowing in the field, which is the world, but it says grain of mustard seed now. So this is representing faith. Why? Because this faith gets contaminated. It's not the word of God. Look at right here. Verse 32, it's contaminated, right? Verse 32, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becometh a tree. So this faith grows that spreads throughout the whole world. And that's why churches say, see, we're going to have a worldwide revival. The world's largest religion is Christianity. Uh, what does that mean, the world's largest religion is Christianity? It's contaminated. It grown so much that it contaminated. It's not contaminated. Yeah, it grows so much that it contaminated. Keep reading. So that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Remember the first parable? When the birds came to eat up the seed? Who, what did Jesus say that was representing? Satan. Those are devils. So the Christian faith grew so much... What happened? That those, uh, it grows so much that the devils start to lodge in it and start to contaminate. That's why you, there's Roman Catholicism. It, they're a fulfillment of the parable right there. No wonder uh, if this is a mystery parable. That's why the Roman Catholic Church is also called Mystery Babylon. How about that? How about that? That is something else. Let's also look at verse 33. Verse 33. The parable of the woman and the leaven. Woman and the leaven, all right? Now, uh, some idiots, again, and I say idiots with, uh, with love, of course, and charity, but you have to be idiotic to say this. They apply the woman and the leaven the same thing as the church growing so much that becomes a mighty force. No, not if you, if you know your Bible. Verse 33. Another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal to the whole was leaven. So notice that when the kingdom of heaven is spoken in mystery form, what happens? It's like leaven when it grows. And there's a woman involved right here. Okay, so this must be a good thing. No, it's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. All right, do you know what leaven is? You don't know what leaven is, do you? Go to Matthew 16. Matthew 16. You think that's a good thing, leaven, in your Bible? Look at Matthew chapter 16. Leaven ain't a good thing. That's why God told the Jews to eat unleavened. It's because it's something corrupt. Let's look at Matthew chapter 16. Verse 12, verse 12. Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the what? Doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Matthew 16, 12. Leaven is referring to wrong doctrine. And in this uh, mystery form that the kingdom of heaven is undergoing, there is a rise of wrong doctrine, is there not? What is leaven also likened to? First, it's sin. It's also representing sin. Go to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. It's representing sin. All right, we're going to look at the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. Verses 6 through 8. So I'm not going to uh, uh, read, quote the passage, but if you read that, notice sin is also mentioned. To leaven. Isn't, isn't that what we're going through right now? Sin is growing so much. During the time when the kingdom of heaven is undergoing mystery form. The woman, who would be that woman? Well, if you uh, know about some woman that God hates, he mentions about the doctrine of Jezebel, right? Jezebel, who starts her religion, at, to the, and he's speaking to the church at Revelation 2. Revelation 17, the Roman Catholic Church is known as a woman. How about that? You've got to watch out for that. All right, go back to Matthew 13 again. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 13. All right, and then what you're going to find out... Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention this. Uh, for the parable about tares and wheat, when the men slept, uh, that's representing 1 Thessalonians 5. What did the Bible say? 
We are not those who sleep in the night. See, but those who sleep in the night, what? They're ushering the end time, the Antichrist kingdom, 1 Thessalonians 5. All right, but anyway, Matthew 13 now, and we're going to look at verse 44. Verse 44. The treasure in the field. All right, what is this treasure in the field? Notice what the Bible says here. Some people might say, this is representing the church where Jesus Christ hid it away. And wait a minute. No, 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 no. That's not it. The church is ongoing. It's accessible. But we know who's hidden away. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth that field. Remember, the field is the world, right? All right, the field is the world. The treasure is referring to Israel. It's referring to Israel. Exodus, uh, you can write these two verses down. down. We don't have time, but Exodus 19.5. Exodus 19.5. Israel is the treasure. And then also Psalms, the book of Psalms, chapter 135, 135, verse 4. Chapter 135, verse 4. The man is uh, pretty obvious. We can tell who is the man that would uh, hide the treasure because uh, it's talking about the protagonist, right? The protagonist. When the Bible talks about Matthew 13, the protagonist for this guy, the protagonist for this guy, the man, the man who does it, right? then we know this is referring to Jesus Christ. So this is the Lord doing it. The Lord, what does he do with Israel? Is that the Bible talks about that they are in the field, which is the world. But notice that the which when a man hath found, so he discovers Israel, right, in the world. Notice, all of a sudden when he found Israel, guess what? He, that's referring to the man himself. Jesus, God himself, he's the one that's hiding. God hides. Wait, God hides? Yeah, Romans eleven twenty five. 25, remember? Blindness in part has happened to Israel. God shut his eyes away from them. They're, they're hidden. The passages to prove it, you can write these verses down. Deuteronomy 31, verse 17. Deuteronomy 31, verse 17. Psalms 13, 1. Psalms 13.1 Isaiah 45.15 Isaiah 45.15 Chapter 57 verse 17 Chapter 57 verse 17 So God's the one that hideth But notice that joy He selleth everything that he has and buys the world See? He buys the world You notice that? The field is the world, right? Wait a minute when does he get the world back to him? How he, so what he does is, well, he goes out and buys it, right? So that's, uh, let's look at Romans 8. Romans 8. So we're going to look at this one by one. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Physically, the world itself, didn't you know that they're going to be redeemed? That God's going to get it back. That's why the Jews, when they get their kingdom back, that's when the world gets its kingdom back too. The world belongs to God. The millennium. The millennium. Let's look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Notice that the Bible says, verse 23, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grow within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the what? Redemption, that's a buying back. See, God bought something back. But what is he buying back? Well, we know that's referring to us when we get raptured at verse 23. But it's not... Notice that the beginning of verse 23 says, And not only they, but ourselves also. Who's they that's been bought? Verse 22... For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. See the world. That's why when Jesus Christ uh, died on the cross and uh, bought us back, that payment also is what? Sometime in the future, I'm going to get that world. 
as well. And he's going to rule. All right, go back to Matthew 13 again. Matthew 13, verse 45 through 46. 45 through 46. Notice that the parable of the pearl of great price. We're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to look at the passage here. 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. Now do you understand the parables? Look at the commentators when they interpret these parables. It's a mess. It's a total mess. They do not understand the mysteries. They're not good stewards of the mysteries. All right, so the pearl of great price at verse 45 through 46, what's that about? A merchant man, protagonist, so we can guess that's Jesus again. He seeks girl, uh, goodly pearls, but what happens? He finds a pearl, and what? Same thing as verse 44. He sells everything that he had. So he, why? To buy that pearl. That's obviously a reference to Jesus again when he died on the cross, gave up everything, so that what? He can buy back the pearl. Who's the pearl? That's you. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. Verse 4. Uh, uh, look at verse 5. Verse 5. Ye also as what? Lively stones. What is a pearl? It's a living stone. It's a living organism. What did verse 45 says? Seeking goodly pearls. See, living stones. And Matthew 13, 45. Uh, 45, yeah. And then 1 Peter 2, 5. You, the church, are what? The lively stones. Are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices accepted, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. You're that pearl of great price. Amen. All right, the dragnet, finally, verse 47 through 50. Verses 47 through 50. All right, we're going to look at Mark chapter 1 now. Mark chapter 1, and we're going to close it right here. All right, wrapping it up. Thank you for your patience, everybody. I hope you got a blessing from tonight. Now you understand about how these parables work. So the church is known as a pearl. The buying, the bought is referring to when Jesus Christ died on the cross. It's referring to Calvary. And then he did the same thing uh, with the Jews as well. You might recall that, right? That's why he's able to restore their kingdom and get the world for himself and be able to uh, restore all of creation. Jesus' death on the cross, you have to understand this. When the Bible says he gave up for the world, he meant everybody, Jew, Gentile, and the earth itself. See? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. See, that's literally everything right there. All right. The dragnet is referring to what? Well, it's referring to basically, if you look at verse 47, they cast the net into the sea, and then obviously they grab, uh, they get any kinds of creatures of all kind from the sea. Verse 48, when it was full, they sat down, and what did they do? They put the good one into the right vessels, and the bad one they put into the bad, the bad they cast the bad away. So what's going, so Jesus interprets that verse 49 and 50, at the end of the world, see? So at the end times, the angels are going to gather the ones that are bad and then gather the ones that are good. And then the bad ones are going to go to hell, obviously. Whereas the good, they're the ones that become the ones in good vessels. So, look, that's referring to us today, Mark 1. That's why we have to go fishing, catch fish. Amen. Look at Mark chapter 1. Notice the Bible says at verse uh, 17, verse 17, uh, verse 16, verse 16. Now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, right? Like the dragnet. For they were fishers. When Jesus saw that, which is like what his story with the dragnet, right? What, was, what did he interpret that as? He says at verse 17, and Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. So that's what we are. We're fishers of men. And then those who become saved, they become good vessels, right? What's that found at? That's found at the book of Romans 9. Romans 9, which we won't turn to for time's sake. Romans 9, 
A good example is verse 23. You become a vessel of mercy. Vessel of mercy prepared for the master's use. So then we see right here, this is referring to souls right here. And then there are souls who, be, who are bad, cast off, rejected. And then those who are good, and they become accepted. And they become the vessels. All right, there's your interpretation of the parables. I hope that you got a blessing. This, Matthew 13, you notice that a lot, of, uh, for the book of Matthew, that has a lot about the physical earthly kingdom for Jews. Matthew 13 is your chapter, pretty much. Why? Because Jesus says, Jesus in Matthew 13 was turning away from Jews here. He's blinding, he's hiding them. And he's talking about, this is what's going to happen when the kingdom of heaven, the physical earthly kingdom for Jews is hidden away. This is what's going to happen. You know what Jesus was doing? He was prophesying church age prophecy. He was prophesying about what would happen to Israel and to you. Heavenly Father, I pray that tonight's teaching was an incredible blessing to the hearers. I know personally it was for me. The parables can be deep and hard to understand. But uh, when we study the scriptures and know about the doctrine of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, and how we are stewards of the mysteries, eyes can be wide open. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs>